Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. This is the Fast Friday edition of the show for February 4th, 2022. And tomorrow in history, February 5th, 1725, James Otis Jr. was born. I think he was one of the most important of the old revolutionaries, but since he passed away in 1783, very few people today even heard his name. They don't know who he is at all. So on this episode, I'm going to highlight some important quotes from four of his most essential works going back to 1761, what some could call the birth of American independence, and I'll wrap it up with some essential views on resistance and liberty. But first of all, before getting to that, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. Our show homepage has everything you need to follow us, all the archives, all the platforms, both video and audio only. Uh, on each individual episode, I publish a blog post and put all the links that I'm mentioning, stuff that I'm referencing so you can read and learn more in context on your own time. And you can even find our membership program where you can put your financial faith behind our work for as little as two bucks a month. And we make it go a long, long way in support of the Constitution and liberty. That show homepage is 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty, all spelled out, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path path to liberty. And I couldn't be more grateful for you spending some of your time with me today. Thank you so much for being here, whether this is your first episode or you've been here for every single one since day one. Thank you so much. But since it's Fast Friday, I promise to not take up too much of your time. Let's see if I can get this info out to you in the next 10 to 15 minutes. And I want to start out, as I often do when I'm citing a historical event, an important date in history, with Dave Benner. Today in history, James Otis Jr. was born. This is a, a blog that we published from him February 5th, 2020. And here's how Dave put it. Today in history on February 5th, 1725, James Otis Jr., a Massachusetts patriot who many considered indispensable to the cause of liberty, was born. A fiery orator, Dave writes, and fierce defender of traditional Whig principles, Otis's role as a colonial agitator was truly pivotal. Awesome, Dave. That is really good stuff. As America's first whistleblower, he tirelessly argued against the writs of assistance. This is 1761. We'll get to that in a moment. And published pamphlets highly critical of British tax policy and some other stuff. Here from the Smithsonian, they put it this way. Otis enrolled in Harvard at age 14. I don't think they do that too often today. He developed a reputation as an eloquent defense lawyer early in his career, successfully defending accused pirates in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and young men in Plymouth accused of rioting on Guy Fawkes Day. They certainly celebrated the 5th of November pretty often in those early days, especially in Boston. They would have a celebration every year. And then on February 24th, 1761, again from Smithsonian, they say Otis delivered a five hour oration, five hours against the writs of assistance, sweeping warrants that allowed British customs officials to search any place, any time for evidence of smuggling, of course. And this is why we often call Otis the, fa the father or the founding father of the Fourth Amendment, even though he didn't draft the Bill of Rights or have any involvement in that, but it's those views that uh, much of it was based on. It appears to me the worst instrument of arbitrary power, argued Otis, and this is back from Smithsonian Mag, the most destructive of English liberty that was ever found in an English law book. The idea that they could search anywhere, anytime without a warrant, no matter what. It was kind of, well, it was a general warrant, uh, basically not something that particularly described the person, place or thing to be searched or seized, as we see uh, later on. Until this case, they write, the 36 year old lawyer, he was 36 at the time, had been the advocate general for Massachusetts, but he resigned rather than defend the writs, then agreed to provide pro bono representation. This is a man of honor. He saw something was wrong. He resigned his job working for the government and then defended fought against it pro bono, pro bono representation to the merchants fighting against them. Inside the courtroom, Otis denounced the British king, parliament and nation as oppressors of the American colonies, electrifying spectators. Pretty amazing stuff. And this is one of I'm wearing the shirt right now, which we have available, of course, over at shop.10thamendmentcenter.com. 
And I think one of the most important things that came out of that speech was him saying that an act against the Constitution is void. An act against natural equity is void. This was a sea change. This was really the beginning of a change of how Americans viewed sovereignty. Sovereignty always means final authority, and it was always in the hands of a king or a queen or a small cabal of people. And here he's pointing out that there's something above the king or a queen. If you had a constitution or a set of rules, whether written or unwritten, of course, we were talking about at that time, then if the sovereign, the king or the queen, for example, decided that, well, what we're doing is whatever we want to do, we have final authority on what that constitution means, then that's something far different than holding that the constitution is the supreme law and the people are sovereign. So it's up to the people to determine what their own constitution means. So an act against the constitution is void. An act against natural equity is void. Now, years later, John Adams, who was there actually watching this, and he was only in his 20s at the time, he recalled that, as he put it, Otis was a flame of fire. American independence, John Adams wrote, and he has said the same thing in uh, early part of 1776 in a letter to Abigail Adams as well. 1761 was the beginning of the controversy between the colonies and Great Britain. American independence, he wrote, was then and there born. Then and there was the first scene of the first act of opposition to the arbor arbitrary claims of Great Britain. Then and there, the child independence was born. In 15 years, i.e. in 1776, Adams wrote, he grew up to manhood and declared himself free. So the beginning of American independence started with James Otis Jr. in his arguments against the writs of assistance, arguing that acts against the Constitution are void no matter what the government has to say about it. Now, it's up to the people to actually make them void in practice. I covered this history in much more detail in an episode last summer, The Real Revolution, James Otis versus the Writs of Assistance. Of course, that will be linked to in the show notes over at 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty. And the next one that I want to cover is in 1764 and another important document, the rights of the British colonies asserted and proved here. He had a section on the natural rights of the colonists. And Otis was really big on understanding natural rights and natural law. And something that we don't often hear people talk about from the founding generation is this one. The colonists, he wrote, are by the law of nature free born, as indeed all men are white or black. I thought that was a really, really good one to include as well, especially at a time when people are talking about the history of the founding being only on racism. When you have people like Otis, John Dickinson, Benjamin Franklin, and other that certainly took a far different view. Then we move forward to 1768 at the urging of John Dickinson, uh, James Otis Jr., along with his great friend Samuel Adams, drafted and got passed in the Massachusetts House what was known as the Massachusetts Circular Letter. They argued against the notion of a living, breathing constitution. So if an act against the Constitution is void and then the government can actually change the meaning of the Constitution like we see happen so often through the courts, uh, through the deep state and the like today, then that Constitution has no meaning and that final authority is back in the hands of the government. So he argues against that type of a notion. And he also argues in favor, along with Samuel Adams, in favor, favor of property rights. Here, for example, they write, in all free states, the Constitution is fixed. It has the meaning today that it had the meaning legally the moment it was given legal force. So the Constitution for the United States, that was when the people of the several states approved of it through ratification. In all free states, the Constitution is fixed. And as the Supreme Legislative derives its power and authority from the Constitution, not from itself, it cannot overleap the bounds of it without destroying its own foundation. And again, back to natural rights, he says it is an essential, unalterable right in nature and grafted in the British Constitution as a fundamental law and ever held sacred and irrevocable by the subjects within the realm that what a man has honestly acquired is absolutely his own, which he may freely give, but cannot be taken from him without his consent. So the idea that what you earn, what you produce is your own property. And if they take it without your consent, 
this is theft. So it's a really important property rights view as well. What many in the founding generation considered the foundation of liberty. I covered that also as well in another episode early last year in February of 2021, Otis Adams Dickinson, the Massachusetts Circular Letter. Of course, that will be in the show notes over at Tenth Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty. Then we jump forward to November of 1772, also with Samuel Adams, but more so this is more in Samuel Adams's work. But Otis had a big part of it as well. We have the Boston pamphlet from the Boston town meeting. And here from an article by Rob Nadelson, he says the Boston pamphlets statement of natural rights, again, natural rights, anticipates the statement of natural rights expressed in the Declaration of Independence. We know that it was very influential on that text. The pamphlet's view of the limits on British power anticipates the balance the framers struck in the Constitution, also influential on what became uh, the final draft of the Constitution or the, what what the principles were that un are underlying the Constitution itself. So some of the statements of natural law include things like all men have a right to life, liberty and property or and this sounds much more like the Declaration in case of intolerable oppression. People have the right to leave the society they belong to and enter into another. And then some of the uh, statements that are precursors to the Constitution, for example, the right to support and defend their natural rights in the best manner they can defend them. This is an important indication, Rob writes, that the Second Amendment's right to keep and bear arms includes a personal right to self-defense, not some kind of collective thing, as a lot of people want us to believe. Or, for example, the legislative has no right to absolute arbitrary power over the lives and fortunes of the people. This, Rob writes, foreshadowed the limited nature of congressional power under the Constitution. That is November 20th, 1772, what we can call the Boston pamphlet. And then just two more to wrap it up that I think are really important. He noted in, uh, I think this was in 1767, writing as freeborn American, he said, it is of the utmost consequence that we boldly oppose the least infraction of our charter and rights. So if you stood idly by, you turned a blind eye to a violation of your rights, Otis, Adams, Dickinson, and so many others understood that all this would do would encourage more of the same. And then he summed it up with this. This, I think, is the perfect to close it out. He said, there is nothing that will destroy liberty more than a prevailing opinion that it is better tamely to submit than nobly assert and vindicate our privileges. I'll link to all this stuff in the show notes, the episodes, a couple of articles that you can check out, plus the original source documents as well. I hope you found this interesting. I hope it was educational. I hope more than anything, you learned something. That's the most important part of this show. I really appreciate you spending some of your time with me today. If you support what we're doing, please consider a membership. Again, it starts out as little as two bucks a month over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. You can also help us spread the word by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or any other podcast platform, smashing the like button, leaving comments, subscribing, getting notifications on any of the video platforms, especially on the mainstream ones. That will help trigger their, their algorithm and tell them to show us to more people. And it has been helping out a great deal. I can't thank you enough for that help. The membership and all the algorithm stuff all really goes a long, long way. Again, I really appreciate you spending some time with me today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you have a great weekend and I'll see you next week here on the path to liberty.